chapter 2, verse number 8 tonight, and we will uh, sing, uh, or we won't sing it, amen, we'll read some scripture there. Colossians chapter 2, verse number 8, and uh, we'll continue in our Colossians study. Uh, verse number 8, we, we kind of studied last time we met for our study in the book of Colossians, but we're going to go over just a few things there uh, to get started tonight again. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him which is the head of all principality and power, uh, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. And we're going to stop there for tonight. Uh, tonight we're on lesson number 15, complete in Christ. Aren't you glad about that? Aren't you glad we have everything we need in Jesus Christ? I sure am. I'm glad it's not up to me. It's not up to you. It's not up to our goodness and whatever, uh, uh, whatever rituals we might perform, but it's all because of Christ and we're complete in him. You know, every one of us uh, ought to have purposes and goals in our lives. Uh, and, and we need God in our lives to have those right goals and right purposes and help us to do that. And in order for me to have the right goals and right purposes, not only should it be in my life, but my focus must be on the Lord Jesus Christ and nothing else. So often we're distracted in this world where uh, so often we are uh, caused to look to something else, trust in something else. But we as believers tonight, we need to look to Jesus Christ and him alone. We've been studying this for weeks now, and as we talked about these things just a few lessons ago, uh, it comes down to the truth uh, that uh, where we left off last time right here in verse number 8. And this is true. Number one, our life is to be in Christ, not in the world's philosophies. Let's guard ourselves against that. Let's quit uh, uh, believing in the philosophies of society and even that men bring into the church and you and I, let's just, you and I stay centered on the gospel of Jesus Christ and what he's taught us in his word. Uh, we read there, Colossians chapter 2, uh, verse number 8, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. You know, and so in verse 4, we, we see that we need to beware of being beguiled with enticing words. We talked about that before. Uh, much that's in this world today, um, uh, what we might call charismatic leaders and preachers of sorts, uh, they beguile people because they have a uh, very, uh, 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 very, uh, 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 tongues that just deceive people. They say things that are kind and gracious and, and, and inviting things and enticing things. And, and they confuse people because uh, uh, they speak so well. Uh, remember, Paul's the one that said, you know, his speech is contemptible. Uh, he, he did not rely on uh, himself impressing people. Rather, he wanted the gospel to uh, be what affected people. Listen, if a man impresses you, it's the wrong thing. God's word ought to be what uh, teaches us and changes us. In verse 8, we need to be aware of being spoiled, the Bible says, through philosophies, vain deceit, uh, traditions of men, rudiments of the world. And by the way, these all produce cults. These all produce apostasy. Anytime a church allows man's philosophies, uh, vain deceits, traditions of men, uh, rudiments of the world, any of these things to come in, uh, uh, we are in danger of putting these things above doctrine and people trust in these things more than, than the word of God itself. And we must always be on guard about that. Immature believers, they look at uh, some of these things as the most important things and separating and inviting churches as a result. I talked to a preacher friend of mine this week, and uh, his church got split, and the youth leader took off uh, 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 you know, six or seven families from the church, and there were some other problems within the church, a really sad situation, a big church, and, uh, it, it, and how easily immature people will follow someone uh, when they're just following vain deceit, traditions of men, rudiments of the world. And, uh, and a person with a, that... Uh, that uh, that glorious tongue can lead a lot of people astray. 
I've had it happen in my church to a small degree in Japan where uh, one man who everyone thought was uh, very spiritual led five families away. Now, they, guess who he led away? All immature Christians. All of them were. They were, but they all looked at him because he had that, that wonderful tongue and everyone was very impressed with him. And, uh, and, and that could be a real problem. Philosophy, we've got to be careful of these things. We need to keep Christ as our focus and the word of God as our constitution with the understanding that the plain interpretation uh, in, in the Bible is what we all need to learn, study, and, and live by. Uh, here's a couple of rules to keep in mind. I have those written out for you, I believe there. But the first one is this. The word of God is our final authority in all matters of faith and practice. It's not you. It's not me. It's not my philosophy or your philosophy. The Bible is the final authority for all matters of faith and practice. Make that a rule of your life. Now, uh, the Bible the, throughout it talks about the scriptures are the authority. Uh, and so let, let's keep that in mind. Don't, don't let your philosophy, whatever, or anyone's philosophy, pull you away from the Word of God. Let the Word of God judge our lives, not our lives judge the Word of God. Another one concerning the interpretation of Scripture is this. If you're interpreting Scripture, if the plain sense makes sense, seek no other sense. I like that. If the plain sense makes sense, seek no other sense. So, in other words, when I'm reading the Bible, if what I read there, it, it speaks to me and, it, and it's clear, believe it, amen? Uh, preachers love to find the Greek and Hebrew and tell you some new meaning. Beware of that. Uh, I'm careful. Uh, sometimes we'll define things, and, and, and I'm not saying it's wrong to define things and, and talk about what that Greek word might mean, uh, but preachers like to impress people with all their Greek and Hebrew knowledge and they really don't know that much usually. <laughs> they just read it in a, in a lexicon somewhere. And, 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 but just give the definition and that's fine. I find this that oftentimes we give definitions to, get, to say, to give it more meaning when the plain sense of the word said the basic same thing. You know, and so let's be careful of that. And so uh, oftentimes though, immature Christians uh, will follow someone who has some new philosophy, some vain tradition, some rudiments of the world. And we got to be careful of that, and not after Christ. Uh, I, uh, I've had people through the years get mad at me over an offering box. You know, have an offering box. Why? I don't. I, we need to pass the offering plate. Why? I mean, just why? Well, it was tradition. You know. Well, don't get mad over it though. You know. I mean, I know it's different. I mean, for some people, it's different. I've had people the last couple of weeks say, uh, 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 "Marcia had a visitor here." And she says, Pastor, I wanted to give an offering, but you never took an offering. And we don't, you know, God, listen, God takes care of us, you know. We don't have to tell every visitor, here's where you put your offering, you know. We try to, but, and I try to for those folks' sake. But uh, some people like that. Some people, uh, uh, when we got rid of the pews, got mad at me. Because why? Pews are tradition, you know. And, uh, you know, uh, you know the, the Bible says that they sat on a plank of wood in, uh, you know, in the, uh, I think under Ezra, you know, he spoke from a Paul flew the wood, and I think they, I think they stood. They didn't, hey, they didn't have seats under Ezra, so we everybody had to stand, you know. Well, at least we have seats, praise God. Just don't get too worried about all that stuff. But what we should worry about is the plain teaching of the Word of God. Uh, listen, we read there, verse number 8, uh, uh, again, um, it ends with this, and not after Christ. Christ needs to be the focus of our lives. Listen, we are saved because of Christ. We're saved because of Christ. This is something that we speak a lot about, but it always bears repeating because we never know who might need it. We never know who might have doubts, even in our service on a Wednesday night, or who may have made a profession of faith when they're young, but it was never real. I was talking to uh, one lady here, and she, she had a profession of faith uh, for many years as, she, as a child, but never really got saved till her, her early 20s. And, and that happens sometimes. So you never know who might need it. Salvation only comes as a result of faith in Jesus Christ alone as our Lord and Savior, nothing else. We repent of our sins, we put our faith in him, we believe on him, and uh, he'll save us, he'll forgive us, and, and, and take, give us a home in heaven. We praise the Lord for that. By the way, we're not saved by a prayer, but we can be saved through, with prayer. Uh, I'm not saying that can't happen, but uh, a prayer doesn't save me. It's my faith in Christ that saves me. 
and many people will trust in Christ by uh, an outward uh, uh, thing uh, by praying. There's nothing wrong with that. But we're not saved by a prayer. We're not saved by good works. We're not saved by the sacraments nor through penance. Uh, understand, by the way, what penance is. Penance is suffering, labor, or pain to which a person voluntarily subjects themselves uh, or it's imposed by some authority as a punishment for faults. In other words, I'm, I'm earning my own salvation. That's what penance is. And we don't believe in that either. None of these things will save me, only faith in Jesus Christ. Titus 3.5 says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. So we're saved uh, through Christ. We are supplied through Christ. It's all about him. Jesus Christ does it all. It's not through traditions. It's not through the rudiments of the world. It's not through philosophy. Uh, it's not through vain deceit. It's through Jesus Christ. We're saved through him and we are supplied through Christ. Notice these verses, John 15, 4. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. Listen, all that we have, anything in our lives, both physical and spiritual, are because of Jesus Christ. Philippians 1.19 says, For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. All of it's supplied through Jesus Christ. Philippians 4.19, But my God shall supply all your needs according to the riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I'm glad about that. I'm glad that God can supply the need of, uh, of Craig's prayer request tonight uh, uh, for his salvation of his grandkids. I believe God can do it. Uh, uh, and, and you pray for that. Uh, God will supply that need. I believe God can supply John's basic need for tomorrow for, uh, for, for that briefing he has to give. Uh, the Lord God, uh, we're going to depend on him for that. Uh, I, you know, I, I find this, if I depend on the Lord for whatever I do, it's a lot better situation than I just depend on myself. Hey, I fail a lot. But I'm just going to depend on the Lord. doesn't mean I'll do my part and study and pray and ask God for help. But I'm going to depend on him to deliver. Uh, and all of us need to do that. 2 Corinthians 9, 8, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. So uh, we are supplied through Christ. We are spread through Christ as well. In other words, uh, when I say we are spread through Christ, it's just for my alliterated outline. We grow through him. Uh, we're to flourish through him. And John 15, 5 goes on to say, we read John 15, 4, but John 15, 5 says, I am the vine, ye are the branches, he that abideth in me, and I in him, the saying bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing, listen, because of Jesus Christ, that I can grow and, and flourish and become something for him. Uh, all my growth is all because of him. I'm saved through him, I'm supplied through him, and I spread through him, I grow through him. Uh, John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so He is the Word. I must depend on Him. It's because of Him. 1 Peter 2.2 2 says, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word, that ye may grow thereby. So I need the Word, the Word of God, and I need the Word, the Lord Jesus Christ. I need them both. The Thessalonians' testimony for Christ uh, uh, actually grew uh, and spread as they learned to depend on the Lord, and we can learn that from them as well. In 1 Thessalonians 1, 6 and 7, it says, And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction, with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that ye were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. Verse 8 says, For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place, faith to, to God word is spread abroad, so that we need not speak anything. So even our testimony... Uh, can spread because ultimately because of him and by the way what should our testimony be the grace of God in our lives that's really it that's my testimony that's your testimony uh, not my greatness or your greatness even our church's greatness but of God's goodness upon our lives his mercy and grace that's our testimony and that's what it ought to be so we know uh, that uh, 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 tonight our life is to be in Christ not in the uh, not in the world's philosophies. Number two, uh, we also realize this, Christ is God. Christ is God. We read this in Colossians chapter 2, verse number 9. Don't forget this. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. 
You say, well, that's a pretty simple point there, Pastor. Christ is God. We believe that. But let's understand it. He is God. Uh, he and God and the Holy Spirit are one. And all, in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now, what does that mean? Well, in verse 8, we learn that philosophies, vain deceit, traditions of men, rudiments of the world, were all likely problems in the Colossian church. Uh, remember, we talked about there was a, uh, uh, a couple of months ago how that there was a cult and they were trying to infiltrate the church, most likely there. And it was rising up, and, and these different philosophies were coming in and getting them to trust in something else. You know what all the cults attack? They always attack the body of Christ. In other words, that the literal Jesus Christ and his body uh, being a, a God in the flesh. They don't like that. Jehovah Witnesses don't like that. Jehovah Witnesses say that, well, uh, he was not really God uh, in the flesh. He was just a great man, a son, a lesser God. Mormons say he was his own God, used to be uh, a man like us, became his own God of his own world. But certainly not the God Elohim of heaven. Uh, lesser than God. Uh, all cults uh, reduce Christ to something else. Jehovah Witnesses don't believe that Jesus Christ rose bodily from the grave. Do you know that? Spiritually they believe it, but not bodily. And so they attack the body of Christ. All cults do. And so, kind of interesting that even back then, they, the, uh, he said in him, uh, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And, and that's something we need to understand. Uh, the uh, uh, and and I don't like to get hung up on all these studying all these uh, different uh, uh, problems in the early church. Uh, we have our own problems today. What all these traditions and all these uh, uh, philosophies were, uh, and, and I, I read a couple commentaries these last couple of weeks, and boy, they I mean they spent like nine pages of a commentary talking about all these different rudiments of the world that really don't affect us at all. Uh, uh, Philos, uh, for instance, was a Hellenistic Jew who uh, uh, de developed a philosophy uh, uh, that would uh, integrate uh, the scriptures with, uh, with Greek culture and Greek, uh, uh, you know, Greek philosophy and such, and how this was infiltrating itself into the church as well. Uh, and that, while that may be so, it really doesn't affect us a lot today. We need to be careful of the things that are infiltrating our church today. There is a lot of vain philosophies. Uh, churches are changing quickly. We mentioned a few weeks ago how that the big church over there, uh, one of the churches up in Mason, changing their whole stance on uh, uh, the LGBT uh, agenda, uh, changing their view of it just to uh, just to facilitate, you know, uh, you know, people to keep coming to their church and and them to be popular in the world. And, and, and there are, we're allowing philosophies like that. We gotta be careful of that. Uh, but we also gotta be careful of old traditions that are also out of sort in the church still today that don't go according to the Bible. And so uh, we, need to, we need to be careful of that. And by the way, the fact that Jesus in the flesh defeats all the cults and false beliefs, it takes all those things away. Uh, away. We gotta make sure we understand what it means Jesus Christ in the flesh ourselves. And so, uh, by the way, there's nothing that's needed in our lives to make Christ look better than what his word teaches. I want you to remember that. God's word does the work. I don't have to apologize. I don't have to try to explain bad things away out of the Bible and cover up things and hide things from people. God's word will defend itself. I just need to preach it and teach it. Amen? So do you. Uh, don't try to, uh, I can adorn it. We've talked about adorning the gospel of Christ ourselves. In other words, we we're talking about that, I, that my life would, uh, would, would be a blessing to God's name, not a curse to God's name. That I wouldn't be a bad testimony for him. But ultimately, my life, the only way I can make the Lord look good is by reflecting who he is in my life. And God's word doesn't need anything. We don't need to make it more palatable. Let Christ and his word do the work in people's lives. And so let's focus on him. Let's preach him, him alone, and allow him to work in our lives. Because he is God. And he is the one that was sent in, and was the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And let's understand it this way. A, God is our God over us. 
God is our God over us. God is our God on the throne. He's our Father God in heaven. As a father is always over his children, so in like manner we have a God in heaven that is over his heavenly children. Psalm 17, 8 says, Keep me as the apple of thine eye, uh, of the eye. Hide me under the shadows of thy wings. Psalm 71, 3 says, Be thou my strong habitation, whereunto I may continually resort. Thou hast given commandment to save me, for thou art my rock and my fortress. Matthew 5 16 let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father which is in heaven first uh, John 5 6 5 7 says for there are three that bear record in heaven the father the word and the Holy Ghost and these three are one and so let's remember that God is in heaven he is over us he is our God the father and know this as well be Jesus Christ is our God with us he's our God with us we know that uh, because he became flesh. John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1.14 goes on to say, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so uh, he is God in bodily form. Hebrews 4.15, For we have not a high priest, which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, what was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. And so we have a God over us, uh, that is God the Father. We, had God, we have God with us, Emmanuel, Jesus Christ, the Son. And then we have, of course, the Holy Spirit, our God in us. And he is. The Bible teaches us that he indwells the believer. 1 Corinthians 3.16 Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. But much philosophy, much vain deceit, much of the rudiments of the world are based on the fact that, or, or try to deny the fact that Jesus Christ is God bodily in the flesh. Don't let anyone try to take that away. Uh, don't try to make it sound better. Just say it like it is. We have a triune, uh, what we call the Trinity, a triune God. God. God the Father, God the Son, Jesus Christ, who came in bodily form, and the Holy Spirit of God who dwells in us today and is with us right now. Praise the Lord, for, by the way, for the Holy Spirit. He comforts us, He teaches us, He leads us, He convicts us. He does such a work in our lives, we ignore Him often, but, uh, but He is so necessary to who we are today. And we're thankful for that. Remember this, number three. We are complete in him. We're complete in him. He, uh, he, he's the God that is over us. He is the God that's with us. And he is the God that dwells within us. We have everything we need to live for him uh, uh, right now. Let's do that. Let, let's live for God. Let's quit making excuses of uh, why we can't and realize that if God's over us, and he's with us, and he's in us. We can do anything he wants us to do. Uh, we have the Father above who loves us, Christ who died for us, and, 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 and the Holy Spirit that enables us and teaches us and comforts us. We're complete in him. A, we are filled with his righteousness and knowledge. We're filled with his righteousness and knowledge. Uh, he's given us everything we need. Uh, sanctified, redeemed, declared righteous, given wisdom and knowledge of him. 1 Corinthians 1.30 says, But of him ye are in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. B, we are filled with his attributes and, and uh, abundant life. We're filled with his attributes and abundant life. We are new creatures in him. Uh, he's done so much for us in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I love John 10.10. 10. It's a great verse to memorize. But the thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and destroy. I am come that they might have life and they might, that they might have it more abundantly. So he has, uh, we are filled with his attributes and an abundant life. All because of the wonderful things that God has done for us through Jesus Christ. We are complete in him. And remember this, number four, he is head of all. He is the head of all. Look at verse number 10. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Now, the Bible mentions here that Christ is the head of all 
all principality and all power. And they believe that this is uh, referring to the unseen world of angels and demons, uh, and particularly to those that are of Satan's realm. Uh, he is the head of all these principalities and powers. Always remember this. You do not have to fear them. Uh, let's live our lives for God. Let's, let's live by faith. Not, uh, let's walk by faith, not by sight. Let's live for the God uh, uh, of heaven. Uh, he's in charge of all these things. I do not have to live in fear of them. One of the, cult, one of the things about the cult of the Gnostics uh, they believed in ranks and angels and ranks and demons, but they really majored on the hierarchy of these things. I think that's a dangerous thing. Now, by the way, I do believe there's a hierarchy of angels. I think there's levels of angels. And I don't understand it all. We, we see some instances in that, of that of about Michael the archangel, uh, uh, Lucifer being uh, 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 the anointed cherub. Uh, so we know there are some, some truths to that, but we live in a world that loves to overemphasize things that aren't important. And so there's a lot out there. I remember, uh, maybe you have, I read this the book by Frank Peretti. Anyone read that book? Uh, Pre this Present Darkness, years ago, read that book. I don't know about all that now, you know. You know kid, you're 20 years old, you read it, you're like, oh, this is really all going out on, you know. Uh, I remember the Archangel Tao was in there, you know. I, I, I still remember that name, I don't know why. But overemphasize, we overemphasize these things that are going on. Perhaps they are going on. What's it matter to us? What, what, what do the unseen battles of angels matter to me? I've got a calling of God. He's revealed to me in his word what I need to do. That's what I need to be caring about. Not be overemphasizing uh, anything that the Bible does not emphasize. And so the cult of Gnostics believed in the ranks of and hierarchy of angels and demons. Uh, and, and though this may be true, uh, uh, that uh, there, are, there is somewhat of that, it's important that you and I uh, look to Jesus Christ uh, uh, and, and trust in him and, and realize that Christ is ahead of all of them, over them all, and I don't need to worry about it. I'll let God handle those unseen things. I'll let God deal with those things. I find this, I've said this before here, when we overemphasize things in the spiritual world that we cannot see, we'll start to see some strange things. Every Christian that I've ever met who overemphasized this unseen battle of angels, they always saw weird things. Isn't that funny? I had a guy I worked with years ago when I was, before I became a missionary, where we were living in northern Ohio. I'd work all night at this uh, uh, Kidron Airport up there, and I was a night dispatcher. And this one fella, he, he, would, he did the day shift. I did the night shift. We usually overlapped about an hour. And uh, I loved the night shift because I was the only one there. It's a great job. And he worked the day shift. I said, you've got to be around all the brass, man, you know, all the people in charge. You've got to deal with them. But he's always telling me uh, about, man, he's fighting the devil. I said, what are you fighting the devil for, man? Let's just go serve the Lord. Oh, I'm fighting the devil. And I said, yeah, I saw something last night. And he said, yeah, what was that? I saw, I went home. And there's a dog hanging in a tree by its neck. Uh, someone hung it there or a demon or something hung it there. And I looked again, it was gone. And yeah, things mess with your mind if you worry about that stuff. I don't worry about that stuff. I never see any weird things. He always had strange things he'd see. And, and, and he was a missionary's kid, as a matter of fact. He was older than me, but he was the son of a missionary from like the Saipan area. Listen, let's not overemphasize those things that God does not overemphasize. Uh, Number five, uh, the, we see a circumcision of the heart. A circumcision of the heart. Verse 11 says this, In whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of sin of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. And let me just say this tonight. Remember, the Old Testament, its rituals ended with the death of Jesus Christ. All of its requirements, all the requirements of the law, uh, when Jesus Christ paid the sacrifice uh, on the cross, paid for our sin, uh, listen, all the Old Testament rituals and sacrifices ended for us uh, because of Jesus Christ. Remember that significant thing that happened in Matthew 27, 51. Uh, behold, the veil after Jesus died, the veil of the temple uh, was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent so we understand that that was a sign from God that he had ripped the veil in the, in the Holy of Holies 
Everything was opened up to us and no longer was there this uh, separation of the priest and man. All men could be priests before God. No one had to be in between us and God except the man and the, uh, the, the God-man, Jesus Christ. And so uh, the circumcision uh, now was not to be any other kind than the circumcision of the heart. Paul says it, it this way uh, for, uh, for those who are creeping in with the Judaism, the cult of Judaism within the church. And by the way, that, that cult's still creeping around today. Still creeping around today. Still trying to infiltrate the church. Those who are always worried about, uh, uh, you know, uh, instituting the sacrifices or trying to be a part of, the, of Jewish worship. That's no part of us, man. We're, we're Gentiles. We're believers. We're Christians. We don't have to go back to that, but there's still those who are trying to go into it. I had a man who was always obsessed with it in Japan, always worried about what's going on with the Jews and, uh, and what things we should do as a church. And ultimately he left the church after a while, kind of went off the deep end on some of that stuff. And, uh, but uh, that ha the, the, the Judaism still is creeping back in. We need, do not need to work about, uh, worry about either circumcision or the, uh, or the Judaism. Rather, you and I, we need to focus on what Jesus Christ has done for the world, how he gave his life for all, and anyone can be saved, and he needs to be our focus tonight. That's our focus. God's word, Jesus Christ, let him change my heart, save me, change me, uh, help, let him uh, uh, help keep my heart right, uh, uh, and, and, and keep my focus on him and his word, and I won't be able to go wrong. Lesson 15, we are complete in Jesus Christ. Let's stand. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. And, and Lord, even in these teachings in Colossians, Lord, these are necessary things that we need to study. And God, we thank you that to know that uh, God, in the Godhead, we have everything we need. A God over us, a God with us, and a God in us. And thank you for that, Lord. And, and Lord, help us to keep our focus on you. Help us not to... Uh, Follow vain traditions, rudiments of the world. Help us not to follow vain deceits or philosophies of man, but rather just hold to your word and stay there, Lord. Bless our invitation tonight and the needs that have been mentioned. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's turn